Chapter 8. Definition of Mental Health Oppression, the Organized Abuse of a Social Structure that Forces All Human Beings to Conform to It. By adapting, we mean that human beings are forced to assimilate the values and beliefs of this particular social or cultural structure in order to be labeled as normal. Thus, a person is considered normal if they resemble, as closely as possible, the values and characteristics of the dominant classes of a given society. For example, in Western societies, these characteristics of the dominant class would include being male, heterosexual, white, property-owning, adult, or middle-aged, and so on. These characteristics are fundamentally impossible to achieve, for example, for a black lesbian working-class girl. Therefore, in order to be normal, we have to adapt to certain inhuman values, such as being submissive, productive, obedient, violent, materialistic, unconscious, self-sufficient, conformist, competitive, insensitive, etc. All human beings and the social structures around us are guided by these values and expectations, our mothers, fathers, families, work colleagues, teachers, schools, politics, neighborhoods, social services, hospitals, etc. No one can escape this reality as there are no other alternatives. And those who are not normal are stigmatized as crazy, weird, abnormal, unbalanced. Stigma means that a condition, attribute, trait, or behavior that has been attributed to the person carrying it is included in a social category toward which members generate a negative response and are seen as unacceptable or inferior. In other words, it is the set of prejudices, labels, according to the social or cultural structure toward a range of the general population, the most oppressed and therefore the most vulnerable part. Dynamics This exercise will help the group recognize and reflect on the kind of mental health oppression that we all experience in our societies. What happened when you cried in your childhood? What were they saying to you when you were angry or afraid? How were you supposed to behave? What do you think a mentally balanced person should be like? Which people around you have been considered unbalanced? How to reduce mental health stigma in our regions? All human beings are unique, singular, and distinctive. It would be a precious opportunity to be able to maintain our humanity and develop it without restrictions. Being normal is impossible in oppressive societies, yet all people try to fit in, not to be excluded. There is nothing wrong with fitting in itself. The point is that we are urged to adapt to dehumanized systems that force us to be submissive, individualistic, competitive, insensitive, aggressive, conformist, and therefore unhappy people. The positive thing about this situation is that, as we have been saying, we all have the capacity to use the innate recovery mechanisms that the body has for these same situations when the information received is contrary to our natural expectations. Our main mechanism or ability to get rid of these damaging experiences is to express and describe to other human beings what is happening, hurting, or confusing us. This usually, if it is not too repressed leads to other more basic innate mechanisms of emotional release, such as crying, trembling, laughing, and yawning. These mechanisms help us process confusing information, recover from damage, and maintain our humanity. Babies, not yet able to use their language skills, use these basic mechanisms directly. The oppression of mental health is based precisely on the disruption of these recovery mechanisms. As a result, we are unable to recover from harmful experiences, and therefore accumulate information and confusing messages that make us vulnerable to abusive behavior and thinking. This is how, little by little, we drift away from our humanity. Emotional outlet. Emotional venting has the capacity to get out an intense feeling that confuses or distresses us in some way. When we suffer hurt or loss, we tend to cry, when we are afraid, we tremble, when we are bored or under stress, we yawn, and when we feel nervous or slightly embarrassed, we laugh. Each of these emotional outbursts, which are spontaneous actions enables certain hormonal regulation processes, either by releasing hormones when there is a lack of them or by producing additional hormones when there is a deficit. Emotional releases help us to process stuck information and to overcome complex and confusing situations as they produce various neural stimuli in our brain. These neural stimuli help us to feel good and the body to function better. These natural processes can be experienced consciously or unconsciously, without knowing why we cry, laugh, yawn or tremble. 
They are the instinctive neurological responses that the body activates to process and expel the confusing information that remains in our brain after any stressful situation. They provide our mind with the ideal conditions to process the data from any damaging experience. This is why we consider crying, yawning, laughing and shaking to be the true emotions, as they actually have the ability to dislodge, move out the stuck feelings from the mind. Note that this concept is far from the generally accepted definition of emotions, joy, sadness, disgust, anger, fear, and surprise. Yawning helps regulate tension, reduces stress, and facilitates relaxation, it helps our mind pay more attention to what we are doing. That's why we yawn when our brain gets tired or bored. After yawning our mind speeds up and we can regain interest and attention. When we yawn, whether natural or forced, it stimulates a very interesting area of our brain, the precuneus, which helps us to relax and feel better. It sends torrents of substances and hormones into the blood, including serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, nitric oxide, GABA, acetylcholine, ACTH, MSH, glutamate and so on. The direct emotional benefits of continuous and prolonged yawning are many and varied. For example, it significantly improves mental alertness, sociability and health. It promotes empathy, pleasure, sensuality, intimate relationships, self-reflection, and improves memory and cognition. Yawning also relieves pain and physical tension, helps to regulate brain temperature, to readjust neuronal functioning, with migraines, multiple sclerosis, throat hypertension, stage fright, with the after-effects related to the use of certain medications and drugs, etc. The cry. Tears produced to lubricate the eyes have a different chemical composition than those produced as a result of having feelings attached to them. The latter contain large amounts of adrenocorticotropic hormones and prolactin. So when we need to regulate any kind of imbalance involving either of these two hormones, our body tends to cry. The hormone prolactin serves to stimulate the adrenal glands, to increase milk protein production, it improves prostate and impotence problems, and it is responsible for libido. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH helps to reduce stress, to increase memory and concentration, to strengthen the immune system, to improve digestion, ulcers, diabetes, malnutrition, etc. And with sleep disorders. Crying offers us some direct emotional benefits, such as relieving pain, whether emotional or physical, enhancing enthusiasm, increasing hope, expanding curiosity and the desire to learn enhancing the thirst for new experiences, coping better with loss and grief, and making us feel delight and well-being, if the crying process is complete. The laughing. When we laugh, we stimulate the production of beta endorphins and encephalins, polypeptides that act as neurotransmitters. This natural morphine is called the happy hormone, because it makes us feel better. After laughing, these hormones remain active in our blood for the next 24 hours. Laughter helps us to release small or large amounts of fear or embarrassment, such as when someone trips or gets confused. We can also laugh in tense, violent, uncomfortable or stressful circumstances. Laughter is a release mechanism for the tension generated by these situations. It helps us process and reorganize complex and intense information, and we quickly feel better. Although it may seem strange, laughter is closely linked to fear. For instance, when we have to speak in public or face a challenging situation, our kidneys, the adrenal glands get activated, leading to a desire to urinate, sweating, and even tics or spasms. This state of being is often referred to as being on edge. During such times, laughter can naturally emerge as it helps alleviate fear. We can learn to harness laughter to our advantage when dealing with our deepest worries and fears. It can also be used to dissipate anger and aid those who have experienced humiliation, shame, or other forms of abuse. On a chemical level, laughter helps stimulate the production of endorphin hormones, reduce blood glucose and stress levels, increase pulse and heart rate, improve the elasticity of coronary arteries, and enhance the immune system by triggering anti-tumor and antiviral defenses. Laughing also provides direct emotional benefits, such as an increased sense of confidence, acceptance, initiative, security, joy, and closeness. The shaking. It is the ally of laughter when we are in a safe environment, our body can relax even more and it is possible for our mind to work on the deepest fears and accumulated complex tensions. Our innate bodily mechanism for releasing the deepest fears is trembling. 
it can be intermittent and mild, spasms or tics or it can be continuous and intense, anxiety, stress, phobias, etc. This innate recovery mechanism is the least understood, studied and analyzed. It scares people deeply when it appears, as it usually shows a state of very intense fear or panic, as that is exactly what the body is trying to eliminate. Consequently, people who suffer from frequent tremors, nervous tics, panic attacks or similar bodily reactions end up being forced to use psychiatric medication. Unfortunately, this type of medication inhibits, masks and suppresses the body's innate emotional recovery mechanism and thus its ability to recover from damage. Consequences of not being able to adapt to the system. Mental health oppression affects all human beings. With the looming prospect of madness always lurking in the background, we strive to keep our difficulties in adapting to the oppressive system a secret. To avoid being labeled insane and to appear normal as if we fit in smoothly with society, we usually conceal and hide the dissatisfaction, sadness, fear, anger, isolation, etc., that we have accumulated over time. We stop showing our internalized turmoil and its effects. We try to keep them under control so that they are not noticed by systematically suppressing the use of our recovery mechanisms. We stop showing our emotions. Since containing the urge to use our natural coping mechanisms, emotions is not an easy task. We start to anesthetize ourselves, hoping to stop feeling so much discomfort. Some of the most commonly used anesthetizing tools are alcohol, drugs, work, television, food, pornography, painkillers, psychiatric medication, etc. If we are not able to adapt to the oppressive system, to contain the pressure, in a moment of crisis, for example, to fully anesthetize ourselves, or to further contain our emotions, we may start to use our emotional release mechanisms and act under the influence of unprocessed information, i.e., irrationally. In these intense situations, we may be labeled as crazy, unbalanced, dangerous, mentally ill, etc., and we may end up in prison, ill, injured, or dead. Although not easy to see, violence, wars, accidents, isolation, suicides, and other behaviors dangerous to human existence are some of the most extreme consequences of mental health oppression. Standardization stops change. Given that human beings, and consequently our planet live under enormous and brutal oppression and abuse, we ask ourselves how it is possible that we all allow these things to happen and suffer so much pain and confusion. Why don't we change things? The fact is that the normalization of the entire oppressive system and its social expressions allows us to adapt to it as if nothing happened. Throughout our lives, we have received messages such as, things are better now than in the past, this is the way things are, our culture is much better than others, and so on. At the same time, we are able to normalize oppressions as we are distracted by seemingly more urgent or important concerns, such as maintaining social divisions or being productive. Therefore, understanding mental health oppression, and its impact on our happiness and fulfillment, and utilizing our body's capacity for emotional healing are the first steps towards reclaiming our humanity. There is still time to organize ourselves to access our inner potential for enjoyment, enthusiasm, vitality, and generosity, our authentic human nature and liberate our minds properly. Stigma in the COVID era. Social stigma in the context of health is the negative association between a person or group of people who share certain characteristics and a specific disease. In a pandemic situation, this may mean that people are labeled, stereotyped, discriminated against, treated separately, and or experience a loss of status because they are associated with the disease. This treatment can negatively affect those with the disease, as well as their caregivers, family, friends, and communities. People who do not have the disease but share other characteristics with this group may also suffer from stigma. The current outbreak of COVID-19 has led to social stigma and discriminatory behavior towards people of certain ethnic backgrounds, as well as anyone perceived to have had contact with the virus. Why is COVID-19 causing so much stigma? The level of stigma associated with COVID-19 is based on three main factors, 1. Stigma in the COVID era. Social stigma in the context of health is the negative association between a person or group of people who share certain characteristics and a specific disease. In a pandemic situation, this may mean that people are labeled, stereotyped, discriminated against, treated separately, and or experience a loss of status because they are associated with the disease. 
this treatment can negatively affect those with the disease, as well as their caregivers, family, friends, and communities. People who do not have the disease but share other characteristics with this group may also suffer from stigma. The current outbreak of COVID-19 has led to social stigma and discriminatory behavior towards people of certain ethnic backgrounds, as well as anyone perceived to have had contact with the virus. Why is COVID-19 causing so much stigma? The level of stigma associated with COVID-19 is based on three main factors. One it is a disease that is new and about which there are still a lot of unknowns. Two we are often afraid of the unknown. Three it is easy to associate that fear with others. Understandably, there is confusion, anxiety and fear among people. Unfortunately, these factors are also fueling harmful stereotypes. What is the impact? Stigma can weaken social cohesion and lead to possible social isolation of some groups, which could contribute to a situation where the virus is more, not less, likely to spread. This can result in more serious health problems and more difficulties in controlling a disease outbreak. Stigma can lead people to hide the disease to avoid discrimination, prevent people from seeking immediate medical care, discourage them from adopting healthy behaviors. How to address social stigma? Studies clearly show that stigma and fear around communicable diseases hinder response. It is most effective to build trust in reliable health services and recommendations, empathizing with those affected, understanding the disease itself, and taking effective and practical steps so that people can help keep themselves and their loved ones safe. The way we communicate about COVID-19 is critical to supporting people to take effective action to help combat the disease, and avoid fueling fear and stigma. We need to create an environment where the disease and its impact can be discussed and addressed openly, honestly and effectively. How to address and avoid aggravating social stigma. Words matter. When talking about coronavirus disease, certain words, e.g. suspected case, isolation. And the language used can have a negative meaning for people and fuel stigmatizing attitudes. These ways of acting can perpetuate existing negative attitudes, stereotypes or assumptions. Reinforce false associations between the disease and other factors, create widespread fear, or dehumanize those with the disease. This may result in people avoiding testing and remaining in quarantine. We recommend language that respects and empowers people in all channels of communication, including the media. The words used in the media are especially important because they will shape popular language about the coronavirus, COVID 19. Negative communication has the potential to influence how people suspected of having the coronavirus, COVID-19, patients, their families and affected communities are perceived and treated. There are many concrete examples of how the use of inclusive language and less stigmatizing terminology has helped to control pandemics and epidemics, HIV, tuberculosis and H1N12. Other tools to combat mental health stigma. Dynamics visibilize, dedramatize, aim to naturalize the psycho-emotional, mental and physical disorders that the entire population has. Integrate and recognize. Theater of the oppressed. The theater of the oppressed could be called theater of dialogue as it promotes the exchange of experiences between actors and spectators through direct intervention in the theatrical action in order to lead to an analysis of the structure of the conflicts that are addressed or attempted to be represented. Through theatrical play, the participants express ideas and emotions, and are encouraged to listen to each other and to concentrate on the perception of different perspectives on the same reality. This theatrical dialogue aims to present the process of reflection on the social implications that influence, or determine the reality represented, and possible strategies of action for its transformation. Dynamics of the Theatre of the Oppressed Artistic Dynamics to Promote Inclusive Education Each participant paints a tree. Painting is taking an object that stains and dragging it, hitting it, moving it on a surface that can be stained. It is an artistic activity so there is no requirement to know how to paint, nor techniques. The important thing is to make the participants understand that creativity and art is a form of expression. Without further details, the activity of drawing a tree is started. Then all the drawings are placed in the center of the circle and observed from a non-judgmental point of view. The aim is to value the uniqueness and beauty of each drawing. Participants are invited to express what they feel when they see each of the trees, promoting a non-judgmental look, 
and valuing the variety and multitude of perceptions and feelings that emerge in each of the participants when looking at the same drawing. Intensity barometer, 010, value positioning, agree disagree. The aim of the following dynamic is to reflect on the social values that govern mental health in our society, but it is also of great interest to make participants aware of where they agree and disagree with the rest of their peers, as well as to delve into the reasons that sustain their values. With all the participants in the center of a room, an imaginary line is drawn that divides the group into two camps. The facilitator reads out statements or sentences that imply value judgments and all the participants have to express themselves in favor. They move to one side or against, they concentrate on the opposite side, without being able to ask for explanations of the meaning of the sentences. After each statement, and after each person has taken a position, the facilitator opens a small debate asking members of each group, trying to get everyone to participate in the end to explain the reasons for their choice. When the debate is over, the facilitator asks if anyone wants to change their position. Phrases Everyone has mental problems at some point in their lives. Mentally ill people have different needs. There are situations from my past that I don't like and often appear as a hindrance in my head. I do what I want to do without listening to pressure from others. I am always wanting to be somewhere else than where I am, focused on getting things, books, degrees, courses, knowledge, beauty and becoming good enough, feeling more fulfilled, or being psychologically complete. <laughs>